Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Okay. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Snatcher Ministries, our partners that are watching online. Um, the word for this morning, and it's going to be a series. I'm going to have Jennifer help out with some of the scientific heavy duty stuff later. But uh, God's really laid this on our heart. And. Um, most of the time, I give you more than you can take notes on. And people will text on YouTube. Uh, I had to play it several times to get the points for it. <laughs> so I kind of go kind of fast, give it a lot. But not today. Today's going to be slow. Today's going to be slow and easy. Are you ready for slow and easy? Yeah. This is for the benefit of note takers. They go, oh, I can actually write that, huh? All right, but the, the 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 word God's been giving us, and it's just, it'll be a series because uh, I can't unload it all at once because Jennifer said so. <laughs> so, being filled with the fullness of God. And I want to give you time to write it down. Being filled with the fullness of God, and I can still remember uh, one of the famous sayings of Smith Wigglesworth. Flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God I'm flooded with God. But we're going to tell you how to do that. It's one thing for him to have it. How do I do that, right? Isn't that what we want to know? Flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God I'm flooded with God. You know, in the uh, early days, people would say they got saved, born again. Then they got uh, filled with the Spirit and spoke in tongues. That's just the beginning. You did not arrive to being filled and flooded with God. What Smith Wigglesworth was talking about was a deep, rich, mystical, yep, let me use that word again, mystical, deep relationship with God and an awareness of the anointing that is supreme. Um, being filled with the fullness of God to know the love of Christ, which surpasses mere knowledge. Oh, so guess what? This is an experience that you can't figure out because it says it surpasses mere knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Ah, oh, you mean I can't figure it out? No, you need to experience it. You need to, the way back home, as Jay, uh, Jason taught it in his series, the way back home is surrender. You can't do it. Surrender and touch the presence of God. Be flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God you'll be, you will be flooded with God. Now, I always got a kick out of that because uh, the, the, the ministry name is Full Stature. That was the vision God gave me for, for the church from early, early on. Kingdom life requires full stature. And I was called to equip, not to be a cheerleader, not to just be an encourager. Those things are all good, but that's not me. I want you to know how to do what the Bible says you're supposed to do. How to do. That's the way he called me. That's what you're going to get. Now, uh, <clears throat> when, uh, when we read in the scriptures, till we all come unto the unity of the faith, until, which means we don't start out there, until we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man or a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So it's a, it's a destiny and it's a goal. It's not something you arrived at just because you speak in tongues. You are not done. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but th what this reminds me of is I'm the opposite of what my dad did. Now, th there could have been various reasons, so I'm not picking on my dad, but he would drive on empty as a lifestyle. And... The worst part was if anybody in the car got nervous and said, Dad, you're driving on empty, he would give you a lecture on how many miles he could still drive on that empty tank. And 
periodically throughout his life, my mother would yell at him because he would run out of gas. Apparently, he miscalculated. Uh, he was an engineer. He had, I didn't understand it because he had a, uh, the closest thing to a photographic memory. He devised an entire sy engineering system for um, uh, numbers, just plain numbers, tank cars, railroad cars, all the parts to the car, a system of different types of tank cars, depending on the commodity they were to carry. And he had a, he developed the entire number system. He could do this all in his head, but he drove on empty a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I go full tank, three quarters, full tank, three quarters, and it's just a habit. But I think I probably need a healing on my dad with a, we we could go we could go thirty more miles. I don't know. It looks like the needle's below empty. So I don't want to go that route. I don't want to see how much I can get away with. I mean, there's enough other issues in life. I don't want to be driving around empty. And as a Christian, neither should you be wanting to drive around on empty. Get the point. All right, that was a pointed message there, but literally indicating it from from the scripture when you're saved your spirit is filled with god but our soul the mind will and the emotions uh is is still filled with selfishness hurts wounds anger and offenses so really uh, i like the way um, one man put it he said it's kind of like um your spirit's filled with god but your your soul still needs evangelized. <laughs> There's parts of you that hasn't heard the good news yet. There's ways of thinking and acting that is not anywhere near conducive to the Word of God. So it needs, it needs evangelized. And that's how you get filled progressively. And that was even my initial scripture, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. And that was, according to Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, that was the definition of a mystic, a Christian who is pursuing deep spiritual relationship with God. And I know New Age and others hijacked that term, but uh, I, I'm taking it back. I'm hijacking it from them and saying this was original intent. You know, we need to get back to our Constitution with original intent would, would, would solve a whole lot of issues in life. So uh, I want to read this. Uh, uh, Paul's heart is my heart for this message. And this actually is going to be a series. Um, but... His message was, my little children for whom I labor and birth again, that Christ be formed in you. He's in you, but that he would be formed in you. Now, let me give you the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. I think it's indicative of the entire series. It gives you like an overall picture. In Matthew 25, verses 1 to 11, it says, The kingdom of heaven shall be likened ten virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them, wise, five foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels, jars, flasks, uh, different translations, but lamps is very appropriate for what we want to cover with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Oh, that means you get lazy. That's not something, even a timely message for right now where we're at in the church and in society. This is not a time to get lazy, slumber, and sleep because you'll be caught off guard. All right? We have intercession to keep us all awake. Um, well, at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of yours, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, The wise answered, saying, These are not selfish people. These are people who paid the price for the oil. It says, Lest there not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell, and you buy for yourselves. Well, you should be buying for yourselves on a regular basis. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. That means you miss out. Um, understanding the lamp. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. That's what Scripture says. So the spirit of man is the lamp. you got the lamp on the inside. 
and our spirit is filled with Jesus, all the virgins, all 10 of them had lamps that were lit. But the vessel, after we're saved, we cooperate with the Lord so that divine spirit fills our vessel, fills. We need, we need souls that are saturated with God. We need to be filled with God's fullness. So apparently you can be saved, speak in tongues, and not be filled with the Spirit. Some people rest on that a little too comfortably. It's potential. And as I like to say about potential, it means you haven't done it yet. Potential is a good thing, but if you, that also indicates you haven't done it yet. You're not there yet. You can't stand up like Smith Wigglesworth and say, flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God I'm flooded with God. And if you can't, then you should be up here too. Because our spirit needs to be filled. After we're saved, we need souls that are saturated with God. We need to be filled with God's fullness. The foolish virgins, uh, foolish virgin, virgins did not lose their salvation but they missed out big time. They closed the door on them. You're not, you're not prepared. You, you think you're at the last minute. That's like those people that think, I'm not going to get saved, but on my deathbed. Well, I hope you have that opportunity. You don't know that. You don't know that last minute waiting around to get your life squared away. I don't know. You can get it squared away at any stage of your life, but I'll tell you what, sooner is better. So the foolish virgins didn't lose their salvation, but they certainly didn't receive the reward that God was anticipating he made available to us. So the reward of attending the wedding feast and whatever that really entailed, what's the difference? You lost out. And the verse that we've used in uh, actually all of our training uh, that sums up this process uh, is found in the message translation of uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 in the message, we're familiar with it like in the King James Version. It says, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God that are pulling down a strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing, every proud, arrogant thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But the message really lays out exactly the way we teach it. The message says, we use our powerful God tools. Now, when it says we use our powerful God tools, when you use your powerful God tools, it's implying that you have them in you. You don't look outside of you for the God tools. Fitting, we have these God tools, and what are they going to do? They're going to fit every loose thought, emotion, and impulse. Mind, will, and emotions. We're going to fit it together to make it useful, in other words. We're going to take this thought, emotion, and impulse, loose thought. You know what that means? It's all over the place. It needs to be corralled and brought under the authority of the Spirit. So it says, our tools are ready and they're at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience unto maturity. God says, I'm going to take these loose thoughts, emotions, and impulses and place them into a structure of a life that has been shaped by Jesus. Your life is to be shaped by Jesus. That mind, will, and emotions need to be, and, and when we say search your heart, what do we say? Search me, oh God, for the obstructions, the loose thoughts, anxious thoughts, hurtful choices that I make. Those are the ones that need to be corralled and brought under the authority of the Spirit. That puts oil in your lamp. And the oil, every time you deal properly with something, the oil is filling your lamp a little bit more. The vessel, yeah. The vessel. Now, what we're going to talk about is the fact that the kingdom of God is within you and we want to be filled and flooded with the fullness of God. And we're going to go through a series of 
uh, at least eight areas, and that's probably going to be over a period of time because I, Jennifer told me I have to go slow, and I want to finish out this year in obedience <laughs> to God and Jennifer. <laughs> it's not easy, you know. <laughs> but I can do it with God's help, for it is God who is at work in me to will and to perform. So I'm going to let him perform through me. Now, the kingdom of God is within. And uh, we're going to start by saying, I'm going to do this in short little bursts, little layers, but I, I'm really hoping you stick it out until we're done with this series. Or if you go on vacation, you will watch it on YouTube and do, watch it in sequential order. Because God builds according to a pattern based on principles. It's like geometry. You can't start out at the end of geometry and understand it, can you? Because God doesn't build that way. He builds line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, until you are moving forward and upward in the things of God. So I want to start with a simple word, note takers, fountain. The fountain. Human beings can survive four to six weeks without food, they can only survive a few days without water. Water is an absolute necessity for life, and spiritual water is an absolute necessity for spiritual life. God has provided believers with a spiritual fountain of living water through connecting with Jesus. It's a natural supply of supernatural water. When you drop down to your spirit, that's where you drink from. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up unto everlasting life. It's an absolute necessity for life. God has provided a fountain. I felt like the woman at the well this week. I was telling Jennifer that I feel like uh, this aspect of the fountain is really standing out more than normal. And I'm saying I probably like the woman at the well. Jesus, where do I get this water? Isn't that what she said? Where do I find this living water? Where do I get this? You'll never thirst again. Well, we're telling you where it is found. It's within. The kingdom of God is within you. Now, Christ is the natural supply of this supernatural water within. The fountain of living water. Being filled with the fullness of God starts out by understanding that this fresh life-giving water continuously from Genesis to Revelation. If it's that often indicated in Scripture, that should tell us something significant, that this is significant. Don't you think? This is not an isolated case. This is God builds according to a pattern based on a principle, but all through the Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, there's this talk about this fresh, life-giving water flows continuously from Genesis to Revelation and will be available today. The fountain becomes a river that keeps springing up to fullness and abundance. That's where we're trying to go. Starting with the Garden of Eden. Now, a river went out from the garden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads, Genesis 2.10. So there's mention of that river, that life-giving river in the Garden of Eden. Then in the wilderness wandering, he split the rocks in the wilderness, and gave them drink in abundance, like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down the river. Psalm 78, 15 to 17. The wilderness wandering, he was that rock in the wilderness. The throne of God in the book of Revelation. The angel showed me a river that was crystal clear. Revelations 22, 1. So we've got, we've got it, Genesis 2.10, we've got Psalm 78.15, we have 1 Corinthians 10.4, the angel showed me a river that was crystal clear, and its waters gave life. The river came from the throne where God and the Lamb were seated, Revelation 22.1. Then there's the healing of the nations. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be 
healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. Along the bank of the river, all things will grow. Trees will be used for food. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because the water, because the water flows from the sanctuary. Interesting that their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. And he showed a pure river of water of life in Revelations 22, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life with 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And lastly, your own heart, which is what we've taught for years, trying to get people out of here, thinking it flows from here or here. On the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, for he who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John 7, 7.37 Counsel in the heart of man is like water in a deep well. A man of understanding draws it out. Now, if this water springs up, what does that tell you? Springs up. It's down to begin with, the source, the source, the source, the beginning, the source. Everything that we teach gets back to the source. Every word that you hear in your head, you might think you got loaded with revelation, but what's behind the word? What's the source? Is it fear? Is it hype? Or is it the love of God? Is it the nature of God? Again, uh, the only time I ever really got anything out of Facebook <laughs> was the time they did a little video of sheep. I, I'm still fascinated by that. You've heard it, and this is for someone on YouTube that had never heard the story before. Everyone else has heard the story. But there's this whole flock of sheep, and the shepherd calls out. I don't know what he said. It was some other language. and Maybe it was tongues. <laughs> but he calls out to the sheep. Every sheep lifted their head. They recognized the voice of the shepherd. Another guy came along and said the exact words. And the sheep stayed grazing. They didn't, weren't even curious as to who's that talking. That is, a, that is not the voice of my shepherd. I am not listening. I don't take that in. Boy, that would be a good lesson for all of us, wouldn't it be? That's not me. You hear something that's unscriptural in your head, and if you don't, you don't resist it, anything you don't deal with in the initial stage will become an attribute of yours. Huh. Hurt. Get your feelings hurt. You get rejected. If you don't deal with that promptly, you will become an attribute where rejection will be something you're living with. Fear is something you're living with. It becomes an attribute. You weren't meant to carry that kind of stuff. You're meant to deal with it. Now, this fountain, the goal is go to the source. Go to the source. Being filled with the fullness of God is going to be recognizing that we need to go to the source. Now, now we got to get to the problem. You know there's going to be a problem. Oh, that has to be a problem. I was doing so good, and then all of a sudden there's resistance. Uh, all right. Being filled with the fullness of God. Uh, during the prophet Jeremiah's time, if a source of fresh water was difficult to find, if you couldn't find a spring or running water, they would build cisterns. A cistern is not like a lake or a spring. It's not attached to a source. Let me say it again. A cistern is not attached to a source. If it doesn't rain, you have no water. And even if you saved it, a lot of times they were cracked and useless because the water that was collected leaked. <laughs> they had a leaky cistern. Now, in Jeremiah 2.13, I believe this is a thus saith the Lord. If ever the church needs to hear this, they need to say, D -d 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 
are you hearing what the Spirit is saying? Because this is for, to me, the, the whole church. That is, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken, cracked cisterns, which cannot hold water. The Lord says the people have committed two evils. They've forsaken the source. And what, when people forsake God as the source in their life, I'll promise you, you do not have vacuums in your life. There's no such thing as emptiness. You filled it with a substitute. You want to be, you can be like the virgins that their lamps were lit but no oil. Christian in name only. Chinos. Isn't that what they call it? What do they call it? They call Republicans rhinos? Well, I'm called Christians. Chinos are the ones who are Christian in name only. I've had people come and say, well, I went to church once. I'm a Christian. I was, I was born a Presbyterian. I was born a Catholic. I, was born, I must be Christian. I don't think so. It's not a name tag. It's an intimate life with Jesus. How's your intimate life with Jesus? Now, they've forsaken the source and they've hewn for themselves broken cisterns because you won't remain empty. You will fill it with something. And so the examples of cisterns, uh, willpower, trying harder. Have you ever seen a Christian? just spinning their wheels like an energizer bunny, saying, I'm getting there. And then you ask them, where's there? And they, oh, I don't know. <laughs> because you're, just, you're in movement, but there's no clear direction. There's no sense of purpose coming out of your value system. It's coming out of dead energy. It comes out of trying, trying to figure things out. Willpower, unhealthy relationships. There's Christians that are healthier, or not healthier, more comfortable with unhealthy people because then they don't look so bad. That's Get around healthy people and it, it might just check your thinking and maybe I'm not thinking clearly. Healthy people don't think like this. Get around happy people that are satisfied with their Christian walk that are finding a real joy in a Christian walk. If you're not hanging around with them, you reproduce according to kind. You'll just continue that. Status. Cisterns. Some people need status. They need position. They need possessions. If I just had me a Rolls Royce, I'd be happy. I wouldn't be happy because Jennifer wants a Jeep. <laughs> but cisterns can be a hobby oh, Pastor Dennis you, you're saying hobbies are sinful no I'm not saying they're hobby. I'm saying they can be a substitute for God sports hobbies shopping oh I felt the atmosphere <laughs> somebody needs the shopping one you need deliverance from the shopping demon How about religious traditions, job or career, educations, family, fantasy, pleasures, vacations and travel? Pastor Dennis, you're saying this is bad. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's, some people do it to relieve stress. A vacation doesn't relieve stress. Jesus relieves stress. If you don't know how to go to him, what good is it going to do? You're going to need to, you're going to, need to be stress-free from, from the vacation. <laughs> Take vacations, but use them wisely. Glorify God in the midst of it. Don't use it as a cistern. Entertainment, is that bad? No. Education, is that bad? No. But if it's a cistern, I would want to go to God and find out how to deal with that. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain the source of their real life, life, Zoe life, the God kind of life, not carnal life. 
not biological life. Zoe life is the life of God. And here's what I'm going to believe, we, and we have it, and we're going to have an increase. We've got a church where the legitimate needs are being met and they're being identified. Legitimate needs, everybody needs love and belonging. There's nothing sinful about that. We all need security, attention, a sense of real identity, affirmation, acceptance, value, worth, and purpose. Those are legitimate needs. And God has prepared them for you. Now, it's time we start to choose. You want the cistern or you want the real thing? You can be a Christian just like those virgins that didn't have any oil in their vessel. You could be just like them. I'm a Christian. But in name only. Because God's plan and his purpose for you was predetermined before the foundation of the earth. That's what you should be looking for. The plan and the purpose. Now, choose your source. The fountain, I like this one. It never runs dry. The fountain is a free gift. The fountain is forever flowing. The fountain is fresh and clean. And the fountain, fully satisfying. Now, don't you hate that? I'm sure you don't want that. But I'll read it again anyway, just to maybe, maybe trick you into it. All right? The fountain that comes from God as the source is free. That means it's available. It's ready. It's at hand. You have to go there, though. Oh, I'm tired. It's forever flowing. Wow. You realize a source that's forever flowing. That's a good thing, isn't it? Fresh and clean. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm really impressed with this church because I've gotten comments from people out in the world. Some of them are Christian, some aren't. But they've seen the quality of the relationships that you have in this church. And, I, and I'm proud of you. I'm proud to be a pastor because you've been equipped. That means you don't rely on me to do it to you. That's so old-fashioned, church. That's an ego. Having somebody always do it to you, then their, their, their self-esteem is built in what they do not in who they are. You should be the head servant, especially men that say, I'm the head of the wife. That's a head servant. Jesus says, you know, the Gentiles, they do that. They lord over you. Tell them that it's for your good. <laughs> he said, but, he said, who's greater? He who sits at the table or he who serves? You'll say he that sits at the table. Jesus said, yet I am one who serves. Rethink your pecking order. Rethink it. Like I said, fivefold ministry, you're on the bottom. The nature of God is first. The word and the nature, conscience, and then fivefold ministers, delegated authority. They're on the bottom. They should be servants. And in your home, husbands, you're not the boss. That's real bad theology. You're the head servant. God made them equal, men and women. Now, I'm just, I'm just blowing some men's control mechanism right now with that statement. I like to keep the woman under their thumb. That's not scriptural. No. The broken cistern, see if this is, sounds attractive to you. The broken cistern requires hard work. Yeah. The broken cistern is unreliable. Oh, well, sometimes, sometimes it works. That's like Jennifer says, the most difficult addiction to get somebody delivered from is not alcohol and drugs. It's gambling. It's unreliable. But every once in a while, you win something and it feeds that craving demon. 
in that dopamine rush that maybe next time, okay, so I lost the house, I lost the car, I lost my total savings, I'm, I'm in debt, but I might win the lottery. So that broken cistern, that gambling or whatever it is, is relying unreliable. It's stagnant and it's dirty. And Jennifer can prove this scientifically. I like the one she does that. She'll do it later on in the series. The, it's never enough. There is the pleasure center in the brain, one that is satisfied. God can do that. And the other one is craving and never enough. But they're both pleasurable. Lust is pleasurable. Love is pleasurable. Which Lust would be your cistern. And it never satisfies. That sounds kind of a losing battle to go with the broken cistern, doesn't it? It requires hard work. It's unreliable. It's stagnant and dirty, and it's never enough. But then you want that feeling that you had when you were high. So you, you still get addicted to the same old thing because you're looking for that momentary feeling. It doesn't last. It doesn't satisfy. How can you tell? This is for the congregation and for everyone listening. How can I tell... <laughs> If he's talking about me, how can I tell and identify a cistern? I'll tell you when you can tell. When it's broken, when it's no longer available, and you have a meltdown. Ah. It's missing. That's a cistern. Uh -huh. When your cistern breaks, you will know that it was a cistern by your reaction. I can't live without. If you can't, you have to understand that's an idol. I can't live without is an idol. Say that back to me. Idol. Uh, uh. When your system breaks, you know, there's a scripture in Jonah 2.8, uh, different translations say it a little different. But I'll paraphrase it. Those who cling to useless, useless, unreliable idols forfeit the grace that could have been theirs. Because remember, that river is flowing constantly. There's, there's no lack in God. But there is lack in your cistern. If you're unhappy in your Christian life, it's probably because of the cistern. Well, sure, it is. it's certainly not because you're enjoying the living water too much, so I'm, I'm depressed. I'm unhappy because I'm getting too much joy. Doesn't even make logical sense, does it? But you wait until your system breaks, you will identify it. The second thing is you need to ask God to show you. Those who cling to useless idols. God, if I've got some useless idols in me, show me. These things may in of themselves not be sin. I remember when I first met Jennifer and I met her dad. Her dad was a brilliant man. He was a lawyer's lawyer. But oh, what was his actual title in the state of Florida? He was the what? The come. The attorney for the comptroller of the state of Florida, something like that. And the funny thing is, though, his cistern was so obvious. It was education. And it didn't matter how much education you had. You should have went higher. You should have done more. You should have gotten an A-plus instead of an A-minus. And he had it to a... Uh, literally a, a, a demonic realm. It was no longer, education was no longer a good thing to him. It was a cistern. And if someone doesn't do according to your cistern, you react, you manifest. How dare you take it away from me? 
how dare you do otherwise? So let's do that before we even go any farther. Because, you know, when it comes to cisterns, you can argue with it. You can just, I've been with Christians 48 years, I know, in pastor. You can argue, you can justify, yeah, or you can just be honest and say, I need, I need, I need. That would be more, a little more truthful. But you can justify, argue with it. It's not bad. You know what the current trendy, trendy thing is? I've been around too long. I can't put up with trendy things that don't last long. Like, as far as I'm concerned, woke is dead. It's not going to last. It's a fad. The next thing is that God is promising that those who cling to useless idols forfeit the grace. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you to be and to do. And that living water is available and it never runs dry. Why would you choose a cistern? Why would you argue in behalf of it? Because somehow it's making your flesh more comfortable. Nobody argues religion for the sake of the love of truth. For the most part, you're arguing religion to see what you can get out of. Soul-ruled people operate under three principles, and you can tell when they're arguing for or against something in the religious realm. One, they're trying to cope with life. They're trying to control life, and they're trying to escape life, meaning escape the responsibility. Anything you point, Scripture says we should do such and such, such and such. Yeah, but, yeah, I know how that works. I'm not impressed. I want the real thing. If we have a membership drive and drive half the people out of here because they want superficial play-acting Christianity, go. I'm looking for hungry people that want to do what Noah Webster called a mystic. <laughs> he called it... A, a, a Christian who is pursuing a deep, intimate relationship with God and wants to stay connected. Now, that's really what we got to do. Ask God, do I have any idols? You know, I want to disconnect from the cisterns. How many? This is for the people on YouTube. Raise your hands. I can't see you on YouTube. Raise your hands. How many of you would like to disconnect from your cisterns? How many identified your cisterns? <laughs> can you identify a cistern? Is there, what can you not live without? Prestige? Status? Hobby? I don't want to make this too personal, but you know, can you give up your pickleball? Huh? <laughs> not mentioning no names here, but... <laughs> I mean, I, I saw someone had a cup that says, coffee now, pickleball later. <laughs> there could be a cistern in there. Then again, it could be legitimate, right? Because everything that is a, can be used as a cistern can be legitimate. Hobbies, vacations, travel, all of that can be. But it can also be an excuse to fill a need unrighteously when God wants to meet that need righteously. Now, to disconnect from the cistern, we're going to pray right now. Father, if I, have, if I am aware of a particular cistern right now, I, want to, I have to make the disconnect. I receive forgiveness for that emotional attachment. It's like a soul tie with a thing. A soul tie is still idolatry, person, place, or thing. I receive forgiveness for that emotional connection. Ooh, that felt good in here. Somebody disconnected. <laughs> now I'm reconnecting with God. My emotions belong to God. I am connecting to the fountain of life within me. How do I know if I disconnected? It changed to peace. That craving, that yearning, that neediness, all of a sudden disappeared and it changed to peace, then I did release and disconnect from it. Receiving forgiveness for that emotional connection. You know, soul tie isn't just bad people. It's not just toxic people. 
Soul ties can be a person, place, or a thing. You can be attached to a cistern. You know, it doesn't have to be carved wood and stuff to be an idol. And those who cling to useless idols, cisterns, forfeit the grace that could have been yours. So if Christianity has ever gotten tough for you, I promise you there's a cistern somewhere. Somewhere where you're not connected to the source, you're connected to, I need, I need. It's okay, it's legitimate, it's not sin. That's usually a sign. If you're justifying something's not sin, <laughs> you might have a cistern. Anything that's more important than connecting with God. Hmm. How many have made an excuse for the things that we call mature Christianity? You know, how many, how many made excuses for mature Christianity would be uh, to take attendance seriously, not legalism, but seriously. Some people have even orchestrated their life around four services where they can be combined with the rest of the body of Christ. What about tithing? There's a, there's a no-no subject. Tithing was before the law. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Then there was the law of tithing. One guy even said, you know, think about it. And the scripture where it says, when have we robbed God? Well, you've robbed him with your tithes and offerings. The guy says, do you realize when you rob him of your giving, it's, you're not like a real robber? A real robber wears a mask. You are blatantly open-faced, revealing yourself that you're not a giver. And uh, Bill Morford would say, he says, the Didache, first thing, these... 12 apostles of Jesus. You think you can trust them? In the Didache, these 12 apostles of Jesus were teaching three times in Scripture. It talks about where they were teaching the apostles' doctrine before there was a New Testament. And the thing they taught was to take care of the church financially. Take care of those people that are in charge. Honor them. They have, this is before there was a New Testament. Then the New Testament, tithings mentioned six times. And as Bill Morford says, not one time are you told not to, but trust me, trust me, there will be plenty of people who make an argument in favor of not giving. It's a cistern, no. It's not really theology. It's a cistern. Wait, disconnect from the cistern, and reconnect to Christ. Don't argue, justify, or just plan. Vision of the church out of living water flowing from the base of the temple like we talked about, this fountain. One time in my Christian life, I was in a supernatural trance. And I mean it was real. And I was in a person's house that had a stained glass window that was shaped like this with the three posts coming down. And the sill, window sill, of course. And God showed me, that you are called to plant the church and that is going to be the way you do it. And it's going to be an atmosphere in the church that's mandatory. It's love, acceptance, and forgiveness. No, no religious spirits. The second thing is that it would be built upon intimacy with God and discipleship. And evangelism was to go make disciples, not just win converts. And guess what? This is, I'm a baby Christian at the time when I went into this strand, but I knew that I was going to be planting churches. And he said, and from the base of the temple is going to flow rivers of living water. And that's actually you. Out of your belly flows rivers? Well, from the base of the sanctuary flows rivers. You think there's more rivers flowing from the base of corporateness than there is individuals? Yeah. But learning to receive... I, I, I can't just 
disconnect from the cistern, I've got to learn to receive. Well, it depends on some things. If you're a note taker, write down these. There's probably six things here. Desire. There was a cry in the charismatic circle some years ago where they said, more, God, more. Regardless of the application, the word is good because you should be desiring more. You're not going to receive anything if that desire is shallow. More. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness that they will be filled. Knowledge. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth and Paul, having passed through the upper regions, come to Ephesus and finding some disciples. He found disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we've not so much as even heard of a Holy Spirit. That's almost like the condition of the church. There's supernatural knowledge that needs to come. Wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to apply the how-tos. We don't need chinos, Christians in name only. I spell that chino. It's like rhino Republicans or rhinos, okay, Republican in name only. Give equal opportunity, Democrats in name only, whatever that means. Honor. Wisdom in applying the how-to. So you need desire for more. You need the knowledge of what, what that entails as far as applying it to the Holy Spirit. Wisdom applying the how-to's, which is what we do and part of the vision of the church. Honor. You know, Jesus, do you think Jesus was anointed? You think? He went into his hometown and many people didn't receive him. Familiarity. Familiarity breeds contempt. They missed out big time because they had a cistern of familiarity. Oh, well, he's just Joseph's kid. Heck, I had drug dealers when I got saved and they found out I was pastoring. They showed up. They wanted to see that. They wanted to see Dennis. <laughs> but the only thing they were worried about is they come up to me later and they go, you didn't put me in your book, did you? No, no, you're not in the testimony book. Honor. Yielding. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Yielding. If you listen to Jason's series, surrender is always the way back home. No matter how goofed up you are. You can say, all the goofed up people, come on down. Give it a shot. Of course, you'll have to want, have a little bit of desire for more and not someone who goes like this. There, you're fixed now forever. You don't have to do nothing. Joe Heavy Speaker had the anointing and he did it to you. Or actually, you know, you'd be a lot more comfortable just being an audience. Just listen, don't do nothing. Just put your Christian face on. Yielding or trying. To receive depends on trying. And lastly, consecration. Now, talking on cisterns is hard because you have to deal with the truth. You have to deal that there is a problem. If you want to sweep problems under the road, this is the wrong place because we actually enjoy the fact that manifestation is good, even the bad manifestation, because at least it's coming out. Uh, at least I hope it's going, not coming. <laughs> but, and what we call here intentional sanctification. Some people were raised in the church where sanctification was, oh, just the ebb and flow of life will bring you to the place where you eventually get it worked out. Well, that could work. Circumstances could have a certain effect on you turning to God. But 
intentional sanctification is doing like David. Search me, O oh God, for anxious thoughts, hurtful ways, secret faults even. That's passion. Secret faults. That means I don't know about them, but I don't want anything to stand in the way between me and you. I don't want anything to come between what you and I have together. I want you to write this down for the future because I'm probably not going to get to it. <laughs> but the part of what we will be covering in this is the hierarchy of need. And the hierarchy of need <coughs> is, if you want to take notes, because this is something you can practice until the next message, make four platforms. Four platforms. The biggest platform on the bottom, then the next platform, then the next platform. Four platforms. Four little rectangles on top of each other. Because I can give you a summary of where we're going. We'll give you the specificity, but I wanted to give you the summary of this because I think this is significantly important for this time and this age. The bottom one is trust. The second one is love. The third one is value. And the fourth one is purpose. The hierarchy of need is a term that we apply to it because like if you went to a, uh, you want to give somebody the gospel but they're starving, you would meet the lower need before you can meet the higher need. Hmm? Trust is on the bottom. I said trust on the bottom, then love, then value, then purpose. But these build on each other. Jesse Penn Lewis always quoted, you can never know the love of God until you trust him. Does that make sense based on that little diagram? Trust is foundational. No trust, no love. But people with cisterns skip. They find ways to feel valuable that are totally self-made. They found ways to feel valuable. Who knows what it is? Could be titles, position, job, whatever. Fame. <laughs> you can't skip the steps. Cisterns are what people do. Purpose. You aren't walking in your personal destiny until you've gotten down to a more implicit trust in God. You can't, you can't jump stages and expect things to work out. We're going to cover those individually. How to raise children, how to do that, how to move from trust to love. What happens when a person's had trust shattered in their life from the beginning? That's, the kind of, that's where we're going with this. So I'm giving you like the overall. But right now we're not, we're not, out, of, uh, <laughs> we're not out of the cisterns yet. What a way to end. I could probably, nah, not enough time. Ah, too bad. <laughs> Ending on, this is like when you're watching a television program and somebody gets shot and then they end the program, you gotta wait till the following episode. <laughs> well, consider yourself shot today, but there's a really godly solution coming. But then again, if you're not here, just feel bad today. <laughs> Father, thank you. Thank you that you began this good work in us, that we're going to be like those virgins. Well, I'm telling you what, my mind, will, and emotions to get flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God I'm flooded with God, and so is this church. Amen. But let's, for the, for the new year, you want to make a New Year's resolution? Identify your cisterns and reconnect with God instead. Reconnect with all your arguments justifications, how you can justify. Well, it's not bad. Education's not bad. Vacation's not bad. It's not, not bad. If you're using it wrong, it's bad. If, you, if it, all of a sudden it's taken away from you and you have a meltdown, there's something seriously wrong. Seriously wrong. So, Father, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, even before the beginning of next year, there's going to be a soul-searching 
move of God for more of him. More of him means honesty about getting rid of some of those cisterns. And so we pray this now in Jesus' name. I keep hearing the word groundbreaking, adventuresome, fresh, novel, original, visionary, artful, clever, creative, imaginative, ingenious, innovative, gadgetry, handy, neatly, nifty, practical, useful, complex, sophisticated, adroit, deft, expert, handsome, tricky, brainy, intelligent, sharp, smart. The Lord can either use a jackhammer or we can yield to his leading. <laughs> yeah. He's breaking up hard hearts and the fallow ground of his children. What's he going to do? What, what he is doing is groundbreaking and it's groundbreaking. And, uh, and Jean had the word fountain this morning in intercession. And that's really what's taking place. we got to reconnect to the fountain. But you can't kid yourself. You can't just keep saying, I want more Jesus, I want more Jesus. But there's stuff I can't let go of. There's habits and, uh, and cisterns that are more important than Jesus. Can't help you there. That's where you start with a decision. So, Father, we pray for this congregation that they're going to be like mystics. They're going to be Christians who are looking for a deeper walk, not looking for excuses, but trying to establish a deeper walk with Jesus. Disconnect from the cistern, connect with God. And don't think you can skip steps. Trust has to be, trusting God for, the, for him to be the source is going to take more effort than most Christians are prepared for. They trust in themselves more, their own ingenuity rather than the Lordship of Jesus. So, Father, seal this work today by the power of the Holy Spirit. And bless it as we continue this series. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At Kingdom Life Church and Full Stature Ministries, we equip believers with practical tools for radical transformation and strengthening families. Your generosity fuels Christ-centered teachings that emphasize love, acceptance, and, and forgiveness. forgiveness. By donating even just a little, you're investing in a community dedicated to deepening connections with the Lord and fostering healing through the Spirit. Your support expands our impact through teachings, accountability groups, and initiatives like Team Embassy Online School and Full Stature Marriage and Family Ministry, bringing hope and healing to a hurting world. Join us in this mission. Visit forgive123.com and be part of this life-changing journey. Together, Together, we can transform lives and, and unite families in God's, God's love. love. Thank, Thank you for, for your support. support.